Hey, what's going on, guys? This is GP. This is the Bull. This is JC. This is Flash. This is Denny Hendricks. And you're listening to. And you're listening to. And you're listening to. And you're listening to the Run and Gun Podcast. So what's going on, people? Welcome to another episode of the Running Gun Podcast. And you know, today usually we we talk about sports on this podcast and everything like that. But you know, with with what's going on in the world and stuff, particularly in the United States, I think it was it's appropriate that we kind of hit on what's going on in the real world and everything like that. But you know, yeah, today we I had I had it lined up where we were going to talk about you know college sports and the payment of players and stuff and the Rooney rule. But I think we need to definitely discuss this matter that's going on in our country. JC wasn't able to join us today and that's perfectly fine. We know originally he would have been here, but today I've got, I've got Hendrix with me. So Hendrix, welcome to the running gun podcast. Thank you. Thank you. Glad to be here. You know, um, this is his first time here, so you know if the you know you know if this turns out to be really su- a, a really successful episode, you got to keep coming back. <laughs> no yeah. doubt, no doubt. Um, but yeah, um, I still believe what's going on is very relevant to the sports world because there's no denying it. There is a very large African American um, presence in American sports, uh, football, especially football, basketball, college football. Um, a lot of these young men have come from areas where the police presence is nothing short of volatile. And that's why they use their bodies to become such athletes because they want to escape that reality and give themselves and their families new realities. Um, so I believe what I believe what's going on is very relevant to the sports world. Um, Absolutely. Um, I, feel, I feel like we should we should very first uh we should start off with Kaepernick um because a lot of people now are talking about peaceful protests and they were the same people who were upset when Kaepernick was peacefully protesting he he saw what what was going to happen he felt the temperature changing um and his response and the well not his response but the response to him is what's setting the temperature now. It's been nothing but turning up because um, racist America, I'm not saying all of America is racist, but the racist part of America, racist America, they do not want to relinquish either their actual power or their perceived power. So whenever there's any type of insurrection that threatens that, they feel, oh, if you're threatening racism, then you're threatening America. We all have seen police brutality go against every single race. I'm not going to seriously say black people are the only people that have been being, that are being massacred by the police. I've seen the police, um, Exercise or over exercise their rights with whites as well. Just anybody who they can get their power over. The problem with it is that when it happens to the black man, the black man, the victim is instantly vilified. Whether the crime is selling cigarettes, running down the street, or a or forgery is Correct. always vilified. You never see that with any other victim. Whenever there's the white person who's been who gets shot by the police, like I said, it happens. You see sweetest person ever. The news portrays him, portrays the victim as a victim the way it should be. And all black people are asking for is a when when reckless murder happens, that someone has to pay. Someone has to pay. It should be equal. You killed You killed that man. He was yep. unarmed. He posed no threat, and you killed him. And when it happens in the white community, oh, Lord forbid that it's a black cop, 
what happens? Fired instantly. There, there doesn't have to be media outrage. Fired instantly. As soon as he puts comes back into the office, terminated immediately, pension gone, sentenced. If it's Correct. vice versa, and, it, and you see when it's vice versa, unless there's media uproar, nothing happens or it gets swept under the rug or they get a slap on the wrist. And then you have pictures of judges coming out to hug the murderer and people forgiving. And then what happens from that point on those people realize we only hear, they only listen to the uproar. They didn't want to listen to Kaepernick kneeling and quietly protesting. He That's true. Have, remember, he did that for the entire, almost the entire preseason. He didn't say why he was doing it. He didn't say anything until the media pressed up on him. And then he gave his speech and they hated him for it. They That's hated true. him for it. The action, right. Can you see the action didn't, him kneeling during the, during the, Anthem, they said nothing. It was like no, nobody cared. And so he said, I'm doing this because I want to, um, I want people to bring attention to the fact that police are killing black men and not even just black men. He didn't even say black men. He said brutality. He said the police yeah. brutality. Yep. And then all of a sudden, racist America was in up in arms. But you know what? We know how to, res- well, they know how to respond now. If you don't want to hear it peaceful, maybe you'll hear it when they're when we're burning up your Benz dealerships and the and those barbershops that you violently protested for weeks ago. That same barbershop right. up in flames. Maybe now you'll see that we are tired of having our neck stepped on. We're tired of being shot in the back, and in our heart, we're tired of having our children, our brothers, our teachers, our future electricians, our future engineers, hell, our future football players, newscasters, murdered. Correct. And no, nah, I believe. I believe it's very. I believe that you know, talking about what's going on now is very relevant to the sports world because also with these athletes, you see how LeBron. You see how you, LeBron is always on top. I don't care. You know, I'm a Michigan fan. He's from Ohio. I don't care. LeBron's one of my favorite athletes because of what he does off the court. He's still out here putting in his words, putting, make sure using his platform to be heard. He's doing his actions. He's making sure that the people that the protesters that do get arrested are, you know, getting bailed up, maybe not him directly, but you know, he's behind the scenes. He's always behind the scenes um, and things like that. Um, if anything, I'm kind of upset that we don't see more athletes doing it, but I know how it gets when people get money, yeah. they want to remove themselves from the situation. That that's that's the thing that a lot of people have been like hitting on and stuff on social media was, you know, where and even Don Lemon was talking about, you know, where are your where are the other athletes, the the other activists and stuff? Why haven't you spoken out yet? Where are you? Why haven't we heard from you yet? Things like that and stuff. But I, I did hear I heard what uh I don't know if you saw it on Instagram and on Twitter. The North Carolina Central men's head basketball coach. Lavelle Lavelle Moten he came out and he he spoke out against it and he was saying you know he's bothered by the silence of most white power five coaches now recently you know Nick Saban came out and spoke up and said something Dabo Sweeney's got a press conference scheduled today for three thirty as we record this podcast it's the that that um that press conference hasn't happened yet, but by the time this podcast gets out, that press conference will have happened. But, you know, that all of that, you know, he's just saying like, he's, he's bothered by it. And I think, you know, I've being on social media, I've seen a lot of the HBCU coaches come out and speak. I've seen a lot of the most, a couple of power five coaches come out and speak on it. You know, I saw, I've seen James Franklin come out and speak. Like I said, Nick Saban, Mike Norvell at Florida state. I've seen a couple of coaches come out and speak their mind. I've seen a couple of I, a couple of NFL coaches. I, I I saw Brian Flores from the Miami Dolphins come out and give his piece on it. Yeah, I and everything. Like that. Say again. I think yeah, I saw Flores. Yeah, that that was one I was I was very proud of. But yeah, you know, it's it, it it's true though. We need to see more of these these power five coaches come out and speak. A lot of these coaches come out and speak and say something. A lot of these celebrities come out and say something too. 
I think I saw something where I believe it was uh, Seth Rogen was saying he's willing to pay for for bail for most of the protesters that have been arrested. Yeah, he's been he's been putting his part in. Seth Rogen's always um he's been he's been a giant fan of um equality. I'm pretty sure it has a lot to do with him being Canadian, but um right. uh, yeah, he's all it doesn't matter what the situation is, he's for justice for everybody. And that's and that's another thing that um I just want to put out there also is that this war isn't against white people. Oh, it's it's, it's not by it's, it's not at all it's, by any stretch. It's, it's not racism in all shapes of form. The 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 twisting of the Black Lives Matter into All Lives Matter literally was to demoralize the fact that we're saying not just Black Lives Matter. The full saying is Black Lives Matter too. We're reminding people of that. And yes. By saying that we're in a way are saying, yes, all lives do matter, but my black life matters too. your white life matters to me. You, the Arab, your Arab life matters to me. Your Chinese, Japanese, your Hispanic, your life matters to me. So my life should matter as well. And that's where people, you know, they start twisting it. Then they came up with, um, I'm not sure if I can curse on here, but the BS um, go blue, ahead, go the, say, the say BS, we we are raw matter. and uncut. Yes, the BS Blue Lives Matter, which made which boils my blood. Whenever I see Blue Lives Matter, it lets me know that you get the message. You just didn't like the black part. Yep. You chose yep. you chose that profession, which I get it. Everyone has a job. Everyone has a job, but when you see when you're a cop. And you see that your un, that your homeboy or your partner or someone in your division goes unchecked, and you do nothing about it, then you're not a police officer anymore. You're a criminal just like him because your job is to uphold the law, and you're not yep. doing that. And you're not doing that by hiding facts. You're covering your ass. I fully agree with you. That that's that's very true. Because that's the blue that's lives the, matter. The blue lives matter movement is possibly the the forefront of the racism, and the racists are hiding behind the police. Don't worry, they they did this literally the entire time America's had a police force, and you can check your history on this. I know people well, <laughs> they gonna have to dig deep in this because they don't teach us in history books. But the American police force was not meant to find American law. American law was lawless back during the founding of this country. Uh, American yeah. police was found to capture slaves. It was mm -hmm. founded to capture slaves. You don't believe me? Look up the first, look up in your city or your county, your first police force, and look up the crimes. Look up the fir very first documented crimes. I guarantee you, especially if you live in any of the 13 original colonies or anything close to that, your first crimes were definitely slaver, slavery, either a slave escaping or a slave returning. I guarantee it's going to be something about catching slaves. The American police have been like that, and racists have been hiding behind that, that blue wall this entire time. And 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 the only and this th these riots that are going on right now are literally just bringing more work. Can you see it's happening worldwide? I don't know if you um have caught. Yeah. Oh, there were there were uh there were some small protests in London and in Ireland and in um Milan cities. That yes, they were outside of the you. um, they were outside of the U.S. embassy, I believe, in the U.K. Yep, and, and even in Germany. All, all, all areas that have had problems with policing, problems with yes. policing, and and like, then the, yeah, and like we said, well, the war, the, the war, and and it's crazy because the racists have twisted it to hide that to make it seem like it's against everybody but them. Because even though we're talking about police, it's really not the police. It's the police brutality and the cops that are not do that. A are not doing their job and are becoming criminals and the ones who keep silent and let the criminals thrive. What was the quote? The only thing that's required for evil men to prosper is for good men to do nothing. You're just as evil as them. That's true. And the other thing I want to, I want to hit on it after, because after what you said uh, is, you know, remember how you were saying like, you know, if you were in the 13 original colonies, like the cops were used to capture slaves. Yeah, sir. 
Um, here's my thing about that. You know, where where was where was law enforcement in the South after the Civil War? Because you know, you know, they said that the the armed forces stayed in the South during the Reconstruction of the South to kind of ensure that the re- black people. The reconstruction of the South, um, which was headed by Andrew Johnson, who succeeded um, President Lincoln after his assassination, correct? An attempt to get, which we have to look at to understand reconstruction. We have to look at what it was intended for, right? It was intended to get the Southern states, which had succeeded. Right into the union because after the treaty was signed, the South still was like, We lost this war, but we're still in the South. So, right, they didn't want to become part of it, they still want to be separate. So, then they used a tactic which will go on, which also the same tactic that happened in World War II, which brought Hitler to well, mo- even more power appeasement. They said, You know what? Okay. We want y'all to be happy. What make y'all happy? We want slaves back. Okay, you can't do that. But how about this? We'll keep it separate. Well, y'all can separate. We'll have the whites over here. We'll have the blacks over here. But we don't want we don't want the we don't want the blacks drinking out our water fountains to do this. How about this? To give y'all and to make y'all feel even more powerful, what we do is we'll treat you like upper class citizens because remember a lot of people in the south weren't slave owners in fact most of the whites that fought in the confederacy did not own a slave at all they were too poor they were poor right whites. all they wanted right. to do was to be looked at better than better than the slaves that's all they cared about they didn't care if out of a whole piece of chicken you gave him a drum and the white person had the rest of the wing the, as long as the person up top had the whole chicken, they was like whatever, and that's and that's what caught and that itself gave rise to that that kind of southern heritage superiority. Their superiority is yes, we're superior than the blacks that are, for lack of a better word, or lack of me wanting to use a better word, the blacks underneath us and that was how they looked at it and then that built on and it built on and instead of it just being okay we want the country unified it became this mess of just racial tension and you know the black people who are just happy to just not be slaves you know the white people they would see them doing something on their own no we want to bomb that let's let's burn this city down no we're going to burn this down we don't want them to have anything because we're better than them and if they start building they'll become better than us because they're the ones who built the country that the people who are actually above us are living in and they didn't want that and then from that point on so i know i'm talking i'm talking a lot but from that you're good you're good yeah and from that point reconstruction right tulsa was during that whole period tulsa was building tulsa didn't i was just about to say that yeah tulsa didn't have a very long history because i don't think it actually started booming until 1888 and all it was it was exactly what the white people wanted it was it was by itself we only they only did business with black with the blacks and they supplied the farms that were around the area but the blacks didn't leave out they just had their own they had their own little town they, they had their own bank they were using and trust me they, this part they also left out the history books they were using their own gold right they were using gold right. they, they, were, they weren't using the federal dollar why because it was illegal at that point for cert, for um blacks to have money and equity and you know what they did? They burnt it down because not because it caused a threat, not because they were seeing their raging war. They burned it because they seen they were we were building our we were building something for our own. And then the Tulsa the Tulsa burning literally was the shadow of Seneca Village. And we all know about Seneca Village. This is the reason I can't even look at pictures of Central Park without literally my blood boils whenever I even think about Central Park. But correct, yeah. Central yeah. Park, Central Park was an affluent neighborhood. If you want to know how affluent Seneca Village was, look at the Upper West Side. And if you don't know if you don't know New York like that, 
is Central Park and it's surrounded by all these high rise buildings. There's not a single business in any of those high rises. Those are all living areas. Every, those are living areas in the Upper West Side. And that's what the village was on its way to. They were all the same. And then people, people got notices on their houses, notices on their door saying, eminent domain, you got to leave tomorrow. And they, and for the construction of Central Park, they ain't sugarcoated or nothing. So we're, we're taking your, we, we know you're a doctor, but we're moving you to Harlem so we can uh, burn this down. And th- that, and then the white people is, or no, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm going to stop saying white people, but I'm going to start saying racist because I'm going to call them how it is. Or call the racist who did this what it is. The racist in Tulsa okay. saw what happened to Seneca Village and they were so afraid because they saw what New York was becoming. Because New York City did. Seneca Village was, I think it was torn down sometime in the late 1880s. And then New York started building up. So let's say about 40 years, you see how New York looked in 1920, and they did not want Tulsa to be like that. So they burned it. Correct. And a, and a bunch of other cities in the South, too, a lot smaller. Mississippi had a couple cities that were burnt down. Lord knows Alabama. Yeah. Yep. Those those two states, I'm going to be real with you, they just never have recovered. Those two states on their own. Just, oh, I mean, Alabama's. Say again. It was all part of. It was all part of reconstruction. Um, Atlanta, because even Georgia is really Georgia was like that too. But also, what happened to Atlanta during the war? You remember? Oh yeah, they had yeah, a civil war. They, they, down, they, yep. they needed a whole bunch of people to build the city back up. And guess who had experience on building cities? It was it was the slaves, the former slaves. They came, they built. People wanted to have their servants live close. So what they do, they move the servants in, move servants closer. You have this big mansion. You can't live in my big house, but we'll build like a little, you know, little shacks and stuff, little areas. That's how those um nineteen those houses, those little small Georgia houses that y'all see on the out, um close to downtown Atlanta. That's how those started coming up. And then right. when, business, when business was leaving out the South, because Atlanta was broke for a long time. I think Atlanta was broke um, from 19, from, I guess, from 1920 until like about the 60s. Atlanta was poor. Like they were a poor city. And then more people, um, you know, people would take their business out, like the business owners that had the land. It was like, well, you know what? We're going to move our business to New York. We're going to move our business to Baltimore. We're going to move our business to Miami. And then what you have, you just have all the service that they moved into the city. And then from that, people started having families and coming up with their own restaurants, you know, doing stuff they could do. That's why a lot of Atlanta has a lot of Black-owned construction firms, a lot of Black-owned restaurants, a lot of Black-owned tailor shops, hair salons, all that stuff. And then generation after generation after generation, and then boom, you have Atlanta. And that's what Killer Mike was talking about um, in his thing when he said, if we lose Atlanta, um, we was talking, talking to the rioters and was saying that even though he sympathizes, if we lose Atlanta, we won't have nothing left because there is no other city like Atlanta, especially with its history of how it managed to grow out of the shadow from Seneca Village's destruction and Tulsa's destruction. Right, right, yeah. The uh, Also, to... Um... The other thing I wanted to hit on with you was, you know, that they they had um, taken ex-officer Derek Siobhan into custody, but they overnight last night, well, from the time that this podcast was recorded, they had moved him to another jail out of fear for the coronavirus and fear that protesters that had been arrested that would be placed in the same jail as him would possibly cause harm to him. That's true. That's true. Because that's well, that it, was my it was that was my first thought. It was expected to. Cops who go to jail are pretty much dead when they get there. Um, as you could as anyone would reasonably deduce why. Um, especially a cop, a cop like that, as corrupt as he is, and his history being leaked. Because prisons used to be places of isolation. Um, prisoners didn't really get a lot of news, but nowadays. Uh, prisoners have phones. They have computers inside the jails. 
Um, pe- people, um, you know, talking privileges are a lot more are a lot more lax than they were back in the day. It's very easy to get information on somebody yeah. when you're on the inside. Um, he he would have he would have died um, if if the police didn't take extra precaution for him. And this and we don't we don't need to see him dead. We need to see him properly prosecuted. We need to see him fear for his life. We need to see a judge of, of a strong judge. Doesn't have to be black. Um, just a strong judge with morals and a moral compass to sentence him to for murder at a maximum charge. And we don't need to see what happened with that with that cop in Dallas who murdered that man when she broke into his apartment where there's compassion after it. Um, oh, it's your Breonna Taylor. Yeah, we need to see the judge um, sentence him, lock him up, and treat him like a criminal so that it lets other cops know that when you break the law, no matter who you are, you go to jail. And the part of that is the reason why um, the Epstein suicide was such a um, was such a problem because we needed this. I mean, you know, we're we're not talking about child trafficking right now. I mean, that's a whole other podcast I could go in on. But um, right. I just want to say that to say this with Epstein, we needed to see him, even if he outed out everybody. Him being the man he was, a very rich, powerful man, um, right. go to jail and labeled a molester. Because he'll never be really labeled a molester because he never was tried. I mean, you can – semantics work a, a, a whole lot. Like, we – he died an innocent man because he died. But we need this. But for victims of child trafficking, yeah, they need to see him get locked up. And victims of police brutality need to see someone um, properly prosecuted. Because I don't think, I don't think I've seen maybe one or two cops have been properly prosecuted for murder. Right. You know, right, yeah. See, being a cop is being a cop is a difficult job because you are dealing with roughness you're dealing with the worst of the worst on a daily basis i understand being a cop is definitely you know you're on go from the minute you clock in until the minute you clock off but there's a difference between apprehending a suspect and him dying in your custody or even during a chase or even shooting someone because you fear for your life and just outright murder i mean like the video of the guy of um george George, sorry, the video of George Floyd. I mean, he was on his neck for eight minutes. Like, I mean, I've been arrested before. Um, I'm pretty sure you've seen people get arrested before. Um, he yeah. was, he wasn't resisting. Even if he was resisting at one point, you had him down. You had your knee on his neck. I mean, just you could have slid your knee on his back. He's a big guy on his neck. And then what are you doing? You just he like he literally was begging for water and for air for eight minutes eight minutes yeah eight minutes eight minutes i i literally want if you're listening to this podcast i really want you to look at a clock and then go about your life take a timer and then count out eight minutes and imagine why you would need to have your knee on someone that you have subdued and handcuffed with another cop another cop that with his hands empty that the um i can't remember the name i think his name was officer tau he was an he was an agent yeah. the he, one that was standing the one that was standing in front of the people nothing. right if he got up you couldn't have moved him and you didn't trust him he could have put his gun on him if you were that scared he could have held his gun on him you could have lifted him you know, there was no reason for you to have your knee on his neck like that. I mean, the guy was down by the car, pinned against the wheel. If you can't get him into the car at that point with three of y'all or at least two of y'all, then you deserve, then you, then you don't deserve to be a cop. Why are you being a cop? You're either too old or too weak to actually subdue criminal. I agree. When you're, when you're a firefighter. Absolutely. Yeah. When you're a firefighter or you, let me remember that when you're a doctor, if you're a doctor and you end up getting in an accident, you know, I'm actually quoting Doctor Strange, but you know how it goes. You get an accident, <laughs> right? You're a doctor, and you get an accident, and your hands don't work no more. You're too shaky. You don't go back to doing surgery, do you? So if you can't no. do a criminal without killing them, then you shouldn't be a police officer, right? Because that means you can't do your job 
properly. If I lose both my hands, I mean, I'm pretty sure my job will understand, but I physically can't cook you no more. I can't cook. I can't do anything. I, I cannot do my job. I fully understand that. I, I fully agree with you there. Um, but you know, let's, let's kind of, you know, switch gears here for a second, you know, um, sports illustrated and CNN have both come out with these things, you know, saying, and then, yeah, sports illustrated says, you know, after the protest, you know, what do you think of Colin Kaepernick now? Uh, and then, you know, CNN has a thing where they're saying now, you know, now is the moment to sign Kaepernick and then, uh, Jermaine Wiggins, says Colin Kaepernick would be a token signing right now for someone in the NFL. Uh, Miles Garrett came out and said, this is what Colin Kaepernick was kneeling for. Wall Street Journal says Colin Kaepernick's protest is raging across America. Mm -hmm. You know, every, everyone's saying the same thing. You know, Kaepernick was right. Uh, someone, someone even said it right here, uh, Deadspin, you know, save the BS. Roger Goodell and Jed York insult Kaepernick with fake concern. You know, I, I would personally say, you know, right now, Roger Goodell needs to – do something as far as Kaepernick's situation goes and, you know, sign him, apologize to him, get him on a team. I, I firmly believe because of the man Al Davis was, I think Al Davis would have given Kaepernick a contract and, Ka and Kaepernick would have been a Raider. Personally, that's what I think. But, you know, I, I would say, you know, Kaepernick needs to be on an NFL team this fall and, you Kaepernick know, Kaepernick I, seen, will never play in the NFL again. And the reason I say that now is because now that man does not want to play in the NFL and has no need. He made so much money from his Nike deal and his whole perception of everything that he wanted to do is now obsolete. I don't believe Kaepernick can consciously go out now and throw a football in a game of of people. I don't think his mindset is there. I don't think that we, I don't think that as black people, we need to see um, Kaepernick in a uniform. He needs to stay out to keep the movement going because Kaepernick, he, when he, when he didn't get signed the first year, right. It, 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 yeah. it confirmed everything that he said. It confirmed everything that he was saying. But now at this point, how many years has it been? Let's let's go back. It's been at least four years, four seasons he's been removed from the league. At least four. Yeah. Yeah. Right, that's believe. only just because I don't have my Wikipedia it, up in front of me. Um he yeah, I was gonna at least it's been at least four years. I can I can definitely tell you that as a fact. <laughs> um Right. He he doesn't he doesn't need to, he doesn't need to be um in the league. I don't believe his I don't believe his heart is there anymore. I believe that he because he had he had full opportunity. To, Atlanta will show you what it happened because when he came to Atlanta, oh when yeah, he came to Atlanta, he yeah. they wanted to give him the workout where he had all the media attention, everything, and you know what he did. He switched it to a struggling inner city school and tried to get the media focus to that school. Do you know why he went to that school? That school was run down. I don't say it was run down to offend anybody, um, to offend anybody who goes to that school. But I don't I don't mean run down like it was dilapidated. But when I say run down, I mean it was a run down, like regular run-of-the-mill inner city school that he wanted to bring the attention to. And the NFL said. No, this is our turn. This is our show. You're going to jump for our pony show. And he's done with that. He's ascended to a higher level. He, I don't believe that man, even if someone signed him or wanted to sign him today, unless his contract said that he can still be signed, I guarantee you that that man's not going to sign no contract. And the reason, and the reason, the reason is right there. He, he, look at what he, look at what he's been doing the whole time he's been off. Look at, look at what he's been doing versus AB. He's been he's been out yeah. giving suits to people you, who have court days, job interviews. He's um tut he's tutoring kids. He's making sure people are going to school. He's making sure like people have bags for school. You know, there's so much stuff that he does that that the media never shows you. They only show you him in the uniform because that's what they want you to see him as just a football player. This man's an activist. I'm I'm pretty sure that he and especially after Nike, that Nike signing was 
Cap was Cap's death. I don't know how much he, exactly he made off of that. I'm pretty sure it doesn't compare to that football money. But what Kaepernick is trying to do now for the community, I don't. I'm pretty sure that Nike was just the final. It like y'all miss me. I'm good. I'm gonna use this money to solidify everything I believe in. To fight for everything I believe in. Because he, he easily could have. He easily could have did the dog and pony show. I'm pretty sure that's what they wanted. For him, they wanted him to follow the dog and pony show. That's why they headed at the Georgia Dome. And that's why when he decided to move it, they didn't go to him. I'm pretty sure that if Tom Brady, if this was Tom Brady for a completely non-social reason, if Tom Brady was like, they was like, yeah, we want you to try out at, um, uh, you know, just give him a nice stadium. Or even if we want you to try out at Jerry World. And he went to, and instead of going to yeah. Jerry World, he changed it at the last second to some Texas high school that doesn't get any light shining. I guarantee you, every single camera, every single agent, everybody would have been there. I mean, granted, Tom Brady does also have six rings, but still, either way, even if he didn't, if he was just a regular quarterback, if he was Alex Smith, and you know, if somebody wanted yeah. Alex Smith bad enough, they still would have moved it. But but, That's true. I, um, I agree with so that. So, do you think? Uh, you think even after this, Kaepernick will still go back? Now that you break it down like that, I find it hard to imagine that he would he would return to the NFL. Yeah. I really do. I, I think I think though that he's going to have op. He's going to have like deals thrown at him at this point. Now, owners are going to probably throw deals at him, maybe. But I don't think he'll I don't, take I don't him. See, I don't see his mindset being there. I feel like he's ascended too high for him to um to to go back to being in that dog and pony show. Um, it's almost it's almost yeah. similar to how when um a person leaves an abusive relationship that they don't realize that they're the victim in, and then they go and they you know they fall in love and they get like a person who's not abusive who actually appreciates them. And then, you know, the other person, no matter how much that first person may have changed, you may, that may have been your first love, strongest love, beautiful person, great sex. You're not going back because no matter how good that person may have it, no matter how much money that person has, nothing trumps being appreciated for you. It doesn't. You you can't go back. It's like, why would I put myself back in a situation where I'm stressing constantly and I'm good now? True. And then, you know, the other thing that I wanted to, to hit on, too, is that I'm, I this is just something I, I, I can somewhat see coming here mm-hmm. this season is, you know, when the NFL gets back to playing, the other thing I'm thinking about is, you know, these players are going to probably start taking knees again. Yeah. So my thing with that is, is, you know, a guy like Jerry Jones who says if you disrespect the flag, you're going to be cut and released. It, and when, first of all, this is never even never, about it was the flag. Never you know, what, about it. It was never about the flag. It was never about military. It was, it was about um, police injustice going on in the country. You know, what, what is someone, I want to see what is someone like Jerry Jones going to do? Cause what, what is he going to do when his, when a superstar that he's given money to, like, mind you, he just signed Dak. I mean, I Dak. He just signed just Amari Cooper, back. and I'm uh, that yeah the franchise tag, and then he just he already gave money to Zeke. What are you gonna do if say if Zeke or Amari Cooper starts to take a knee? See, and that's and that's where the black athletes need to stop being so scared because. It, it it it's that it's, it goes to show you that the power of many because I guarantee you like the, these people have stroke have struck sorry struck I'm trying to think of the best way to say have struck went on strike on the past all right I'll say it like that these people have been on strike in the past the strike, like, stri- it's crazy to think about um, these people have been on strike in the past for pay we once almost didn't have an NBA season because of disagreements for pay now imagine if they didn't play because of you know of rights like say say a nba player was shot and murdered because of a cop i right. guarantee you each player would sit down and not play and they would have no money at all they would be bending over backwards right. there's no way they could do a replacement league like they did a replacement in um 
They were in a replacement league before, they and they managed to make a little bit of money because it wasn't political. It was just about payment. But in something political like yeah, that. Yeah, that was the um, – that was the year that the Redskins won the Super Bowl in '87. They had the uh, the scabs because it was the yep. strike season. Yep, yeah. the, oh, the the Redskins. <laughs> yep, but yeah, but yeah. sorry, I laugh because hearing that just doesn't ring right. Good. Sorry to all the Redskins fans out there, but I'm a Baltimore boy. Go Ravens! But um, yeah, still they um. Yeah, if the black athletes band together and was like, we're not going to play until we have some reform, I guarantee you they would jump up. They would jump up so fast. Uh, I fully agree. Because, I mean, even even here here in Tampa, uh, you know, I believe it was it, it was it was Veterans Day weekend. Mike Evans, he he didn't take a knee, but instead he he sat on the bench during the national the anthem. Best for a game yeah he he caught all kinds of grief my thing is what because that's what i want to see when when this starts happening again what are y'all what are you guys as the owners owners roger goodell the nfl players association what are you what are all of you going to do about what are y'all going to do money they want to make sure they get money but now they're saying that they're more now they're saying that they're more that they're more um that there are more decent people in the world than there are racists. And they're going to change their tone. Yes. But those type of people, they don't care about the money. Yeah. And then the other thing, too, is, you know, the college game. We already talked about college coaches and hearing from them. What are we going to do? What are we going to see now when you have, you know, bands that are doing the national anthem before they let the teams out? What are, what are we going to see with that? You know? Are we going to see? I mean, I, I, I have I, my theories of this is one of two things: teams come, teams may come out before the national anthem, and may do something b- before the game, or you know, maybe after the game, you might see both teams join together in a big giant prayer circle. So that those th- those are a couple of my theories that you mm-hmm. might see happen, but I, I don't I, I don't know for certain. Like this is like like this is going to happen. I'm I'm not for a hundred percent sure yeah. that's going to happen, but. We'll see. It's it's going to be something interesting to keep an eye on. Yeah, well. Yep. And then, you know, the other thing, too, that's been swirling around, uh, you you went to an HBCU. You, you've you been to Morgan yep. State's campus. You know, I've been I've, I've been to Florida Classics, Atlanta Football Classics, uh, and everything like that, too. You know, the other thing swirling around is, you know, people are saying, you know, it's time for the, the African-American athlete to – return back to HBCUs. Yeah. They, they, there's there's something on both ends. There's something on both ends, on both, both fronts as far as that goes. That is a whole nother conversation that I honestly, I would love for that to happen, but also me going to an HBCU and also, you know, with my wife being a Florida State um, alumni and seeing the difference, I... I I get it. <laughs> I get it. Um yeah. It's you know like the whole the whole reason why we have such a black athlete thing or such a high black athlete or a black athlete number or black professional athlete number especially in football and basketball is because we go to like these huge schools that can handle 100,000 fans, uh 50,000 fans of this basketball watching you play. I'm just not going to pull the numbers at an HBCU. HBCUs have money that they use to build up their schools, and I don't see that, you know, <laughs> changing unless those schools decide to take uh, PWI money. Like, <laughs> and that that's a whole nother that's a whole nother conversation in itself. Yeah, I I understand. I understand that. That is, I mean, because. A lot of people say, you know, the money will follow the players wherever they go and the players can help build up those schools. And on the other on the other side, too, you have guys, people that say, you know, we the the early that early group of guys that, you know, when they desegregated the South and allowed those players to go to the white institutions, you know, they they fought for that. Right. That's what they wanted. And HBCUs were the safe haven when they had nowhere else to go. So, you know, I mean, I understand, I understand both sides of the argument. I would love to see HBCUs 
rise to the cream of the crop and be that that force you like the SEC is now because I mean hey you know that would be just as interesting to me to see you know how does that sound you know FAMU and Grambling in the playoff every year taking on Oklahoma or Ohio State or a USC or a Michigan and say like the Fiesta Bowl or the Orange Bowl or you know, the cotton bowl or something like that, or the Rose bowl. Like that, that would be interesting would be to see. That would be a fun game. But I just, I feel like I, I don't, I honestly, it, to be, it'd be honestly for me to say is that I'm pretty sure I don't have an opinion on that matter. Not that I think I, cause I don't see that being a bad or a good thing, but I just don't have, I also have an opinion on that one. I've heard people saying it and yeah, I, mean, I do I'm, think it would be a beautiful thing. I would root. I would definitely root for it, but in reality, I don't see that happening. I don't see because there's too many, and you know, someone's going. And then eventually, it's going to it's going to go right back. You, the schools are just too different. You know, now I can yeah. see if black people decide to, or if you know, they decide to make a school or make more development schools like IMG, where you know, where black athletes come together and they build their own high schools for these athletes to start out at. So that way it's more, and that way you don't have um, hundred thousand people trying to apply for thirty slots at a high school. <laughs> right? Yeah, I, I understand that. But yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm like you. I'm like, I, cause like both. Hey, look, both both sides pose yeah. a good argument, but I'm, I'm, I'm right here in the middle where I'm like, I can, That's I can go I that feel. way, but I mean, I can go. They, they sound interesting too. Yeah, it, it's, it's a, it's, it's a, it's a tough one to make a decision for. Um, but now, the the bug 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 is, is, is coming, 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 coming. The the bug 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 is, is, is coming, 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 coming. Uh, trivia with the bug, and I, I'm sure you know about the bug's trivia yeah. questions. <laughs> I mean, yeah, but this this is the next one. Hello, everyone. This is the bug, and my trivia question is. What was Gail Sayers' nickname on the football field? This is the bug, and I'm out. Everybody be safe out there. Thank you. And there you have it. Uh, if you can answer the questions, though, there's going to be a poll up on the YouTube channel for these trivia questions and everything. I did, did, have you answered any of these yourself? Um, no, I haven't. <laughs> One of them, I, I think he asked me ahead of time, so I didn't answer it online. Um, but I think that was the only one. I yeah, got. it was. It was that that Bo. Yeah, the Bo Jackson, Bo Jackson one. Yeah, one. That was about as far as I got. <laughs> he he had one on the last podcast. It was well, not not the not this last one, but the one before. It was you know how many how many American League MVPs did Yogi Berra win? Josh ended up getting that one, and then you know there's one he did on the last podcast where it was you know how many. How many World Series have the New York Yankees lost? Whew. I don't know how many they won. A lot. Because because the thing about it, it's I know they've they've been to they've been to forty World Series, and I believe they have twenty seven. Yeah, they have twenty seven. Yeah, they they won twenty seven World Series. And so, so they've won 27 World Series. They've been to 40. So that's just, yeah, that's, that's math right <laughs> there. Real. So y'all can just, y'all can go ahead and do with that, what y'all, what y'all plan on. Uh, the crazy thing about it is, you know, that this past decade, the 2010s was the first decade where the Yankees didn't even appear Lovely. in a World I Series. Love it. I love it. Once again, Baltimore <laughs> coming out of me. <laughs> go Orioles. Even though I know where we at, but still. <laughs> I mean, hey, all I'm gonna say is, all I'm gonna say is the 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 Houston the Houston Astros cheated, and the Rays should have been in the World Series against the Nationals. That was that's most all I'm gonna say. Facts. <laughs> yeah, that's all I'm gonna say with that because that Rays team was good, and I'm so, the only thing I'm upset about is the fact that the the season has been delayed, and the the Rays mm-hmm. would have been cleaning house this year. I, that's my full belief. I think that they would have hung with the Yankees and they would have hung and Boston wasn't really a threat, but yeah, you, you know, 
But um, also, too, you know, before we get out of here, there's sad news to report. Uh, Pat Dye, the former Auburn head coach from 1981 to 1992, has passed away at the age of 80. So our, our hearts are with the Auburn family. Uh, but, you know, that's that's going to do it for for us on this episode of the Running Gun Podcast. I'm Jay Peeps. And I'm Jenny Hendricks. That's Hendricks. Have a good one. Uh, also, to, you know, follow us on Instagram at Penalty Talk. Follow, I mean, Instagram at Throw Flags. Follow us on Twitter at Penalty Talk. Follow us on Facebook at Penalty Talk. Like and subscribe to the YouTube channel. Uh, make sure you check us out on Spotify. We are now on Spotify. And as always, stay safe, stay blessed. We'll see you on the next episode.